going to show it. I do have a PowerPoint presentation, but I'm not going to show it. But what I can do is make it available, perhaps on the <clears throat> civil education website. So, um, well, uh, the first thing is to explain a little bit about the uh, GHFP, uh, which was founded by Simon Guerin and Sharif Horty uh, back in the mid 90s. Um, I was invited to be a trustee in 2001. And I think initially really um, the foundation acted more or less really as a straightforward foundation, giving grants to suburb projects in particular, but other projects as well, especially in the area of education. But as the years went on, uh, I mean, the um, GHFP started to realize there was lots of interesting um, understanding in all of these different alternative uh, educational projects around the world. And so, uh, we started to, um, before before I was um, there, the GHFP started to arrange kind of meetings and seminars and um, um, so workshops about education where people could explain their approaches and share different ideas. And um, we sort of continued on that track I think, until the middle of the 2000s. Um, um, and it, it culminated, I think, in the Vitachi Conference number three, which was held um, in a university in Fez in Morocco, where we invited lots of people from different universities and schools in Morocco. And um, but I mean, after that, uh, we thought, well, what's next, really? And we kind of came to the realization that um, alternative education. Um, uh, as a private sector activity in many countries was really for sort of quite wealthy people who already had sort of, um, you know, <laughs> ideas that there was something wrong with the existing public or state system. So we kind of thought, well, let's think about the state system. And um, the more we kind of talked about that as a group, um, as a GHFP group, we kind of felt, well, actually, the need for change is most in the secondary school system in most countries, because in many countries, primary school education has already had the influence of Montessori and some alternative approaches. It's a little bit more human centered. But when kids um, arrive in secondary school, as well, they're quickly regimented into sort of various kinds of um, state examinations that they need to take at the age of 14 or 15. And it quickly becomes something which is kind of alien to their nature in the sense that, you know, they're growing adolescence and they have to be quite disciplined and so on and so forth. So we thought, okay, well, actually that will be our project is to try to think about and try to find out about alternative educational practices that can occur within the state system uh, at secondary school level between the ages of let's say 14 and 16, 17. So that, that, was, that was our plan. And uh, obviously, you know, we started off with the UK, which we were more familiar with. We were more familiar with how the system works and the legislation and so on. So at uh, Shoto, Gil and myself, we basically spent a year going around different schools, which were supposed to have as well alternative educational practices, but within the state system. And also we spent quite a lot of time as we're meeting people who were kind of thinking about the same topic as ourselves. And um, I mean, halfway through that process, we thought, okay, well, actually, the best thing that we can do is maybe to write a book. So we did actually write a book about this, which was published by Routledge, and it's called Rethinking Secondary Education by Shoto and myself. But of course, um, actually, it carries the um, 
uh, finger mark the, the handprints of all of the GHFP members, not just um, Shirt or myself, who, as were transcribed the ideas from. Um, yeah, so part of what the GHFP really is, is, is um, an institution, I mean, we're a group of civil members who, as were, uh, give ourselves the time and the luxury to try to feel what's important in the world, try to sense what can be done to change the world, and then feel if we can do something about it. We try to, as were, change human understanding about things that matter um, and then see how that changed understanding can be applied in different contexts. So education is really the first area that we've worked in, but we've also worked in the area of peace because it's the foundation of Gehomes Foundation for Peace. And um, we've had projects in various countries and have projects in various countries related to peace. Uh, such as um, in Rwanda and Lebanon. Uh, in Hungary, we have uh, Sharifs uh, running a really interesting project at the moment, and uh, in Colombia. And then also we have became interested um, in the, uh, over the last few years, particularly in the concept of human well-being, because in a sense, many human activities focus around that idea of as a, what is it for our lives to go better? What is it for a human being to live well, to live a better life? And, uh, you know, we were concerned that, um, excuse me, we were concerned that um, the understanding of human well being uh, isn't wide enough in our current society to encompass really the spiritual elements even at a very simple level, if I can put it like that. Um, so we've also been working in um, interreligious dialogue um, and um, I mean, th those are the, the, the fundamental areas that the GHFP has been working in. And I, I guess we define ourselves as a research institution or a research center but you have to understand there that the word research doesn't have its common meaning, its normal meaning of something that's entirely academic. It's more, may, maybe a, a better word is exploratory. Um, so we use our minds, we read, but we uh, aim as a group to be guided by the Latian in so far as that's possible. All right, so um, um, <clears throat> back in 2010, I guess it was, um, maybe it was before that, uh, we wrote this book. Um, and it's kind of important to understand that the book is not, I mean, it's not really supposed to be applied to schools. The original idea that the, the original content of the work uh, was to describe an educational system that's quite different from the one that we have now, at least in Britain. An educational system, that means as where the fundamental principles um, are quite different from the ones that drive the existing system. And actually that means also that the um, primordial institutions, the core institutions such as schools, ed, uh, exams, all of those things, teachers, head teachers, uh, and what a student is, all of those things are actually different. So we set out to describe a whole system. And that was really the purpose of this book. Um, but of course, as uh, things went on, we had to find ways to apply it. And so we kind of started to think about, okay, well, how could this be applied to existing secondary schools um, in different countries? And that resulted in a second book, which is more like a, a handbook for schools, which I'll come back to in a bit. Okay. Um, so I think probably in to, to, to simplify and keep it short, uh, human-centered education is really based upon three 
principles. Um, the first one is this, of course, education has aims. Typically, the aims of an education system uh, relate to uh, academic things, social things, the society in general, and also to, as with the development of the people, the young people involved, the students. Um, but typically what's happened over the years is that education has become, the educational process and educational institutions and roles have become more and more uh, instrumental, more and more instrumentalized. What that means is, is that the learning processes, the activities of the schools, the roles of the people and the institutions are, are considered to be only valuable insofar as they serve a limited range of purposes. And that's their value, it's just the, the, the aims that they try to attain. That's, that's what their value is. That means that they're instrumentalized. If they, they'd have no value beyond, their, uh, beyond that um, instrumental value to achieve some kind of purpose. So we see that, for example, kids are taught how to read and study, but for the purpose of attaining good results in exams. And schools are, as were, um, incentivized to, as were, teach well, but only so that the schools can get better results, which will then, as were, reflect in better government funding and so on and so forth. So the system is thoroughly instrumentalized. It's instrumentalized not only in terms of the practices, but also in terms, as I said, the roles and the institutions. And of course, uh, you know, when we think about it, we think that, well, that's not really <laughs> a good idea because, you know, childhood and adolescence are not sort of preparatory phases for the working life of human beings, right? Childhood and adolescence are ways of being, they're part of life. And surely we would love an institution such as a school to be a place where kids young people can enjoy themselves. They can actually kind of find themselves and enjoy their time and look forward to it rather than as we're thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to go to school today. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's the really, in a sense, the first principle. The first principle is let's try to recognize respect and in a sense, um, design our practices and our institutions and roles around this idea that learning is a part of life, uh, school is a part of life, and it's not, it's valuable for itself. It's not just valuable as a means to some further ends. And of course, worse still, those ends tend to be couched uh, in terms that are easily measurable for government purposes. They tend to be couched in terms which are quantifiable. And obviously that itself is a kind of another kind of error within this first um, uh, principle, because as it were, we know that the measurements of a value and the value itself are two entirely different things. Right. It's the value that's valuable, not the measurement of it. And insofar as we make our goals go towards the measurement, we're missing out the thing that's actually supposed to be measured, which is as well the learning or development. So that's the first principle. So the second principle is really about the nature of learning because um, obviously, even if you look at a dictionary, you see that learning there is usually defined as um, the acquisition of knowledge and skills. But when we think about what it is to learn in any circumstance, we can see that that's an insufficient understanding because part of what we do when we learn is we learn to value things and care about things in certain ways. So for example, when we, as we learn how to do mathematics, we learn how to be careful and systematic in our analysis and application, uh, an analysis of a problem and our application or implementation of the solution. Uh, you know, when we learn to write poetry, we learn to open ourselves up to new words and ideas and so on and so forth. So um, 
there is some, any profession and indeed any academic subject, uh, right, is actually not well defined as a set of knowledge and even a set of skills. It's actually a set of, for want of a better word, virtues. Virtues there is knowing how to care in the appropriate manners. So a lot of what we do when we teach in a school is implicitly it's helping students to acquire different sets of virtues for each discipline. And they're really different, you know. So I'm sure that you've unfortunately all had the experience of as we're going to a lawyer who has lots of knowledge and lots of skill, but not many of the virtues that we would hope for from a lawyer, <laughs> or maybe the same with accountants and so on and so forth. So um, th this, this idea, of course, is a really important idea because um, we know that there have to be, as were, carings or virtues. I don't mean moral virtues. I just mean, as were, character dispositions with respect to what people care about. There have to be virtues that are kind of part of what it is to live well as a human being, to be in good relationship with other people, to be in good relationship with oneself, to have, as it were, <clears throat> a good um, sense of what one's life could be about. So um, those, those, uh, those virtues, of course, are supremely important for our lives. And, uh, you know, it's quite a struggle to acquire them. And obviously, those kinds of things really appeal to young people. They are struggling with those things in their first moments, uh, emerging from caterpillar to, to butterfly. Right. These are the kinds of questions that young people are asking themselves. So a secondary school should really have that at its heart. It's like it's an institution where people can, where young people can learn those things, but obviously not as <laughs> taught lessons. All right. Uh, the other reason why I think sort of um, this idea of the uh, learning as a um, set of virtues is really important is that actually it forms a bridge between alternative and mainstream visions of education. So, you know, I'm sure that everybody here is aware that as well, there's a lot of people in mainstream education who have quite a disparaging view of, of um, alternative educational practices and systems and ideas. And likewise, from the other side, alternative educational practices are often uh, very critical or dismissive of, of mainstream practices, particularly the, the particularly that tends to um, manifest itself as a dichotomy between the mind, the intellectual mind and the emotions. But we know that, I mean, I think, you know, little reflection shows us that that's kind of misleading because uh, in any school, we want our children or young people to develop both intellectually and emotionally, and more than that, holistically as persons. So that leads me then to the third principle. So the first principle is let's, let's not instrumentalize education. The second one is let's have a broader definition of learning that includes um, the nourishing and cultivation of virtues and forms of caring. And the third one is, okay, the main aim of education should really be the develop the holistic development of the young person as such. So it's about the holistic development of the young person. And of course that emotional versus intellectual um, dichotomy, duality uh, has to, Disappear it has to it has actually we have to recognize the sense in which. 
The only way I sense in which it has where those those things, I mean, they're just convenient boxes. Uh, clearly, people's intellectual lives depend on their emotions. People's emotional lives depend upon their intellectual understandings. And both are not separate from our motivational states uh, as we're learning how to help young people develop in their motivation is such an important part of what education is about. Right. And merely trying to sell a subject and say, yeah, history is really interesting or literature is really interesting uh, isn't enough, right? You've all, as, as teachers, we've all had that experience of trying to teach a piece of knowledge, a set of skills to a set of students who really don't care, who really aren't interested and uh, just think the whole thing's a waste of time. And selling the subject or trying to show, well, this is interesting in this way, it doesn't do it. It doesn't crack the ice. It doesn't actually make the difference that's needed. And that's because the underlying motivational um, problems that the young people or challenges that the young people are facing is not being addressed. You know, a lot to do with their family lives, their situation in society and their own perception of themselves. So there has to be space in a school that is dedicated to the holistic development of young people for that kind of thing. So those are the three um, principles, which are, I guess, more or less described in this particular book, Rethinking Educa Secondary Education. Um, so the second part of the book is really about what that's going to mean for our important educational institutions. And I won't go a lot into that, but basically it's split into four bits. So the first bit, of course, is the curriculum, because normally we think of a curriculum as a set of pieces of knowledge. That's how the national curriculum in the UK is more or less designed. There are relevant abilities which are related to those bits of knowledge. Clearly, it's important for people to know things and to be able to do things, but that can't be the whole story. So we can't define the curriculum in terms of, of, of things to learn in a narrow sense. So actually what we did was we divided the curriculum in terms of time, like time dedicated to different aspects of development of the young person. So I'll come back to that in a, in a bit. Um, the second bit, of course, is pedagogy, the actual art of teaching, facilitating learning in the broad sense. And so uh, that in that part of the book, what we're trying to do is to show how this contrast between the mainstream view of teachers as deliverers of knowledge and expertise and the alternative vision of uh, educators merely as facilitators uh, is insufficient. That's an insufficient duality because if people are to grow and develop, they need guidance. It's not enough to let kids run around on their own, so to speak, and just follow their own interests. They need guidance, but that guidance has to be something that doesn't amount to telling them what to learn, telling them what to do. So that's really the section on pedagogy. Uh, then there's a little, there's a, there's a chapter which I think is really important about assessment, because clearly within contemporary society, we need, society needs, has different informational feedback needs about schools and about, kid, about young people and how they're developing their suitability for various courses of study, certain kinds of employment and so on and so forth. And more importantly, of course, assessment has to be integral to the very learning process because as well, we need to know whether, whether there really is this growth, whether there is this learning in all three senses, that is knowledge, skills and virtues. So there's a chapter on, um, we, you know, we spent quite a lot of time actually thinking about and um, trying to explore different kinds of assessment. And Sherto has, has written a, a separate book about uh, assessment. So, um, um, so those are the three main pillars, you know, from Bernstein, uh, curriculum pedagogy, 
an assessment. But of course, the, we need a fourth one, which is actually what is a school? Like what, what, what is a school? What is a, and so we, the last chapter is really defined, um, I'm sorry, the last chapter is really dedicated to redefining school as a learning community. And in particular, you know, uh, redefining as it were, the, what it is for to be a community where we're not actually always sitting in the roles of being students, teachers, principals, administrators, where there are actually human relationships between people, which are not defined solely in terms of those functional roles. So um, we define a school as a, as a learning community. And the idea is, is that actually um, that, that living together, that coexistence together is part of the learning process. It's actually going to be part of what's learned, the way learning occurs. Sorry, there was something else I wanted to say about that. Um, uh, part of uh, what we did, Shutter did this, was to actually interview a lot of students about their views about education, both in a critical sense, like what they didn't like about the schools that they went to and the education system, and then in a positive sense, uh, so in terms of, um, oh, also what they thought about being an adolescent, how they understood being an adolescent, and also about sort of how they think schools could improve or be changed. All right, so that was um, um, the, the, the attempts to get other people uh, in, let's say, advisors to government to get them to change their understanding of what school is uh, didn't work out so well. People found it really hard to distinguish between improving existing institutions, making changes to existing ways of measuring or assessment and making changes to the existing system and having a new system, having new principles as were at the heart and the soul of this, you know, so it's a completely different enterprise. It's a completely different um, set of activities. People found it really hard to understand that, of course, because they're working in trying to reform the existing educational system. So as we started to realize that that would be a really long haul, uh, we thought, okay, well, we need to really work with schools. And uh, we found some schools, uh, we found a school in the UK that was willing to, uh, as were, experiment. And of course, remember that that age, 14 to 16, schools are very jealous of kids of that age because that's the age when they're going to take their O-levels or state exams, 16. That's, they want those kids to do as well as they can so that the school will perform well in the ranking system. And so, you know, most schools are very, very suspicious of, of any attempt to try out something a little bit different that takes away from the normal academic routine of the day. Um, so we also, uh, as it were, introduced the ideas with varying degrees of depth in other countries. Uh, Shota worked quite a lot in um, China and made quite some progress there. Uh, then we also, um, I had a brief go in Vietnam and in Mexico. Um, but then after a while, I thought, okay, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, Kind of spend a lot of my time in Colombia. I'm, you know, I'm very involved in the Amanecer project and have been for a long time. Let's try something um, nearby. So um, I gave a brief talk at um, the local chamber of commerce several years ago and invited schools who were interested in sort of participating. And. Um, we got several takers, but the most interesting one happened to be really next door to Amanasea. It's a school in La Tebaida, which is about 10 minutes away from Amanasea. La Tebaida is a small town of about 30,000 people. And uh, it's quite a deprived area. And the school was really quite a deprived school. And, but the, the head teacher or principal was really enthusiastic 
and said, this is the way I want my school to change. So we went and we talked with him and he introduced us to some teachers and Rosanna Silva, who I believe is also here today and I'll ask her to speak later. Hola, que tal, como estas? Um, um, started to, as we well, train the teachers in this methodology or approach, I think is probably a better word because it's not really a method, it's more like an approach. And of course that meant as we're shifting um, the mindset, attitude and practices of those teachers, even these ones who were the most, as we're just well disposed to our ideas, <laughs> to our approach, kind of found it quite difficult because school is a place of discipline. And, um, mm, it's not so um, experimental. So what we did is we introduced at first the three, what we call the three pillars of human-centered education. So this is part of the curriculum. This normally in a, in a full human-centered education school, this would only be one part of the curriculum. But anyway, the first idea is to have something which we call emotional time or sharing time. And actually this gives the young kids uh, uh, as well in groups of not more than about a dozen, maybe less, fewer uh. people, uh, the opportunity every month or on a regular basis to, as we're just talk, talk about the things that matter to them, the things they're worried about. And obviously the secret to that uh, is to really construct that space in a way that is confidential, where they're not going to be judged by anybody and where they're going to be really well listened to and where they feel that they can actually open up their hearts. Our experience in the GHFP, <clears throat> not only in education, but also with the peace processes, is that actually when we have a space that is really solid and has that human open quality to it, where people can be honest without fear of judgment, and people open up their hearts, it's transformative because as soon as one person opens up their feelings, it touches everybody else. And as it were, wave upon wave of compassion and understanding of each other comes from that. So that's the first, uh, which is as well, we call that as a sharing time. So the idea is not a curriculum about the emotions, it's just as well to share. And of course, there is a direction towards that. There is a direction, let's say, uh, which is towards greater understanding of others, greater compassion towards others, greater understanding of oneself and more compassion to oneself. But that's a direction. There's no agenda. There's no kind of like framework. Um, that's the first element. Now, the second element, is what we call cognitive time. And in cognitive time, you know, to do this well, you have to really understand where your students are, where the kid, the young people are cognitively. But, you know, it struck us that uh, often young people are taught things, right, when they don't have the elementary basis, the fundamentals that are needed to understand things. So for example, let's take an example. Um, uh, people tend to read rather badly. People are not taught to read well and slowly and carefully that if they are taught to read, then they're taught to read fast. Right. And often people, you know, young people, but older people as well, I just don't, you know, don't, don't as well, treat a book as if it were a living voice, as if it actually was somebody speaking, as if it actually had something to sing. So um, that's just one example. So in cognitive time, uh, we as were have a, uh, like, a, um, uh, um, like a menu of different cognitive abilities. And as were, the idea of cognitive time is to spend um, energy, devoted to those abilities without any subject matter. 
there's no learning of facts. No, no, it's just just practicing these abilities, learning how to see that and learning to see how they're valuable. And part of that has to be helping young people to recognize their own intelligence because people really are intelligent. It's like, you know, my kids are brilliant at, as we're debating like lawyers when it comes to who does the washing up, <laughs> right? Even if they might sort of freeze in a debating club, when it comes to, as were a different context, their intelligence really shines and is strong and energetic. And so as well, the idea of cognitive time is not only as is, is, is to, as we channel that natural um, vibrant intelligence into areas such as critical thinking, discussions, writing, and as I said, reading. So that's cognitive time. So that's got a little bit more of an agenda, but usually that, that agenda has to be really based upon where the kids are, what they really need. And that, that's because otherwise um, it doesn't work. Uh, and, you know, the, the bet, if you will, or the hypothesis, as it were, is that time spent on doing that will really pay off in terms of their capacity to do well in subjects, right? to actually read and understand or debate with the teachers, ask questions to the teacher. So the third area uh, out of the, um, the three pillars uh, is what we call mentoring time. And again, that, that's really supposed to be one-on-one -on, -one on a regular basis and as were each a young person develops a relationship with a tutor or a mentor over years. And of course, it's really important there that the mentor as well gives the young person space so that an attitude and a relationship of trust um, can be built up. The idea of a mentor is that it's the, the mentor time is for as well um, self-reflection about one's holistic development and so as well it's not dedicated to academic study right so uh, um, uh, a lot of young people uh, want to talk about their parents uh, their friends the group they're in the troubles they have in their in, in with with you know their, their groups of friends and things like that uh, not 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 just like what their future is or what work they want to do, but quite often it's really fundamental things. And I think uh, Rosanna will attest later that you know when we did this in the school, actually, um, many of the young people just spent the first sessions just weeping, releasing pain. Um, Okay, so those are the three pillars, and um, we we started off with seven teachers, and I think about fifty five students. In. So this is like the experimental part of, of the school, um, and then over the years, uh, I think it's about three years. Well, it's obviously everything's different with the pandemic, um, but we've expanded now. The school has human centered education as within its official curriculum uh, in all, uh, for all secondary school kids of the age between 14 and 16, that is in ninth and 10th years. And I think we have 18 teachers now. And actually we've made, um, uh, we've kind of introduced human centered education to all of the teachers in the school, not just the secondary teachers. So, um, we were very gradual in the way, I th and thanks to the, the principal, we were very gradual in the way that we approached the other teachers. Because obviously, I mean, maybe not obviously, but the mathematics and physics and chemistry teachers were very resistant to this approach at first. But when they got the idea of, okay, these intellectual virtues are part of what it is to be a scientist or a mathematician, 
and you, that's not part of the official curriculum, it needs to be, <laughs> then, wow, yeah, you know, the whole idea of cognitive time really appealed to them. And then they start to see, okay, yes, the social conditions and relational conditions of the young people, that matters really a lot to their development. So, um, uh, I mean, I think really the, um, um, the, the, the process, which I hope Rosanna will be able to tell you more about, uh, was really one of kind of gently introducing the teachers to the, the ideas and to the approach and kind of slowly molding the thing like this. It was not, it was quite gentle, as, as Lao Tzu says, frying a small fish gently. Um, but I think the results have been quite um, uh, astoundingly good. I mean, the first thing I noticed is that the kids, the young people who were part of this felt really happy because we explained to them, this is time for you. This is for you this time. You, these three times, this emotional time, uh, cognitive time and mental time, that's for you. That's not, you know, that's not the school's time. This is for you. We, we want you to feel that this is for your development, for your happiness. And that really made a big difference. Um, the level of fighting within the school really just the police no longer had to come to the school. Basically. And I mean, uh, I think the school went from being ranked as one of the worst in public schools in the area to being actually uh, one of the best. It uh, was the school that it won a prize for uh, the school, the public school that made the most development. And of course, that's not entirely and solely due to our program because clearly uh, the the, the um, school principal or head teacher is keen to 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 make his school to make the school different and so he had other initiatives as well um, um, we did a measure of um, self-awareness a very simple test uh, at the beginning of the process <laughs> and I can't remember exactly the scale but it's like I think it was like zero to five or something and we had a control we did it we did two groups the, the students who went through the process and then the control group and then we did it at the end of the year and the end of two years and basically uh, the control group I think sort of went from two to three whereas the group went on average our group went from two to four so it was a really significant difference, actually. So I think, you know, we felt that this is a path towards making the whole school a human-centered education school. The um, primary school teachers were really wanting uh, to be more directly involved. And, um, you know, we after talking it over with them over a long period and kind of like trying to suss out what was really needed uh, we decided that actually the best thing for the young for the younger kids was to work with the parents so the school already had a like a sort of parent evenings and so as were we started to introduce human-centered education practices into the time with the parents and we made that more regular the primary school teachers were really understood and were on board with this. So from, from uh, the point of view of this particular school, I mean, our plan really then, our hope is that it, this whole school will become human-centered education school, and then we will expand to, let's say, three or four other schools in the area. And then we'll start to build up our sort of methodology as applied to that area. And then we can start to sort of enter into good discussions with departments of education, both at um, regional level and national level. Uh, Human-centered educational approaches have been used by the, are being used by the GHFP in other contexts as well. So uh, at the moment, um, uh, Shoto has been working with the G20 and has, uh, as we've uh, been introducing, human-centered educational teacher training practices through the Ministry of Education in India. 
So that's just starting and that's very exciting. And also in Amanecer at the moment, we have 44 young women from deprived areas who are, on, um, who are in, staying in Amanecer for four months on a residential training course. And of course the central um, methodology or approach that we're using is, is um, human-centered education. So um, I, I'm sorry if I've left out something or I went on too long. Um, and I'm being asked to speak more slowly, but it's too late. <laughs> but now, if I ask, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to ask if Sharif would like to add something. And then I'd like Rosanna and Martin Fisco, who I believe are here, to add something. So Sharif, do you have something to add? Let me see if I can de make myself visible. Yes. Uh, thank you, um, Garrett. Not, not really. I haven't prepared anything, and I think you've covered the ground beautifully. Um, it'll, I'd love to hear, yeah, of course, from Rosanna what her, her take on the whole process is, because I haven't ever heard that. But no, I, I feel like um, it's the interesting thing about, for me, about the whole human-centered education model is that um, it's when you heard the heard it all it's so obvious you know I say well you know ob obviously that's what education should be like but but then you look back and you see that that's hardly ever the case or there's very very few examples so for me, it's just uh, an amazing, uh, very, very interesting to see how this gets taken up and whether we can, um, you know, introduce it in 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 lots of places. Uh, it, it, I think it will change so many things. Thank you. That's that's me. I think um, um, I just wanted to add something. Thank you. So I mean, the thing I didn't that I wanted to say was the mentor's role is really delicate. And in a sense, the mentor's role, in a sense, is like the human force. That's how I feel it. It's kind of trying to enlighten also him and, and bring to life the human force the, at the human level. And that's why it has to encompass both, as were elements of the traditional approach to education, as well as alternative. You have has to kind of bridge that gap. In other words, what I'm trying to say is you. Um, the mentor has to be capable of, as we're accepting uh, the young person as they are and understanding and caring for the young person as they are, but uh, at the same time, have the vision and the capacity to tease out the powers of development. So that actually is a question of, so the young person is challenging him or herself. It's not actually a question of being static and so the notion of progress is and development is really important there. Uh, Rosanita, Rosanna, estás puedes Gracias, gracias. Aquí estoy. Muy bien. Por favor. Gracias. Te voy a hablar en español y necesito claro. traducción. Bueno, está bien. Um, for, so one thing for, for everyone. Um, Miranda will be providing simultaneous interpretation into English. So if you click on the globe icon and, and click on English while um, Rosanna is talking, um, then you'll be able to, to hear that interpretation. Okay. Thank you, Miranda. Gracias. Buenos días a todos. Qué gusto saludar. To all of you. Um, it's great to say hello to you. I feel very happy to be able to speak about the work of um, human-centered education here in Colombia and the school is a piece of the sky um, at four kilometers from Amanecer. I consider that the work that Amanecer has done throughout all these years I have facilitated the process so that we could uh, work in a way that is a bigger scale in a school um, of the official schools of uh, Colombia, 
we first of all um, got close to the Secretary of Education and the proper actual um, Secretary of Education did a convocatory of all the official schools of 50 something um, coordinators of Quindío. And uh, from there, this facilitated a lot that this school could open the doors because we were um, backed up by the back by the Secretary of Education. It was a very nice, it's a very beautiful thing. I think this not coincidences the fact that this school was to find the profile, education profile, as uh, they hadn't been able to find the way of how to create the reality of this um, this feeling um, of being humanists. When the Secretary of Education um, helped us to be able to go to the school, they found that it was exactly what um, we were trying to show. And we started to is, uh, uh, train eight professors or eight teachers. The condition that the director um, put to us was that he saw and he understood that what this school needed, but if there was no support or interest and motivation on the side of the teachers, it would be difficult to do this work. So, first of all, we did a meeting with all the teachers of the school and um, trying to find teachers who were interested uh, around the ages of 9th to 10th or 14 years uh, forward, we started with eight teachers and it was very, we started to, it was very beautiful. We started to do a personalized capacitation or um, in the principles of uh, education centered, um, cent human centered education. So two a month, we started to work with the time and um, direction and we worked um, emotional time with a psychologist which was trained by the Grand Hermes Foundation and who came to do the work with the youngsters um, so that the youngsters could really center their um, attention with, so that their heart would be very calm and that the, even though they were very young inside, um, is they would be um, healthy, and open so that we could be, we could focalize their attention here. All the year we did this work and through the time we were working on this, I want to tell you something that is a historic in this school. This school has 800 youngsters or kids. Um, one time uh, a, a week, there would police would go because of the fights that would happen there. But when this year finished and we started the next year, uh, to continue with the work, obviously many of the teachers um, started to realize what we are interested in um, getting deeper into this. We want to study. We also want to participate. And so the next year, there would happen that 15 days um, had passed after uh, the, the school had started. And the director called me and said, I want to talk with you. I want to tell you something. And I want to recognize something. Um, and we had already been 15 days and since we started the school not one of those times have we had to call the police this is a great change it's historic for the school and since then they have never ever had to call the police to that school why because um there is this um being closer this um care of a personal conversation with a mentor or the tutor with the youngster this fixes many things in first place it's like an attention it gives an attention that exists because the teacher isn't there on the um, whiteboard speaking and speaking um, even if they have a lot of time together there is no real knowledge of that closer knowledge of of the of the the youngster, this helped a lot. And in the time that there were individual conversations where the youngster starts to become conscious of many things of himself or herself, they start to put their challenges and small objectives or goals to be able to transform their their way of being. And of that something that's missing, maybe this helps bit by bit, bit by bit, so that the youngster can start doing the transformation of their um, their way of being. And so the quality of interaction within the tutor and the youngster is very important. And this helps a lot. Um, it was very, things 
there's something that maybe there's a big problem and the future comes close and the different ways that the youngster can reflect over the what happened. This is very nice because the youngster is starting to ask for to say sorry to the each other and to have conversations that were different to be able to understand the reactions of with the tutors. And this was um, showing a very amazing a different change. I wanted to show um, share another story that doesn't have to be do exactly with the change of the climate of the school, which is what happened, but also a story of a mother who came once to say something to a tutor. Look, I want to ask you what's happening here. What is the change that has happened here in the school? Because my daughter practically is has transformed. There was a great, she was a great trouble at home. There it was in the streets we i didn't know where she was there was she has a younger sister that's two years younger and there is such a thing that's so different my daughter talks differently i can now have a com communication better communication with her and what i want to say to her is that the girl came to say to me is that she would help with her little sister so that she wouldn't have to be in the same path so the mother said practically I can see that something that you're doing is changing a lot of this uh, to my daughter, this girl, and she is um, bettering the relation and the family level as well. To say there's many sense, so many ways um, um, human centered education has helped in the education um, system. There are many other things, uh, but they would be too long. So to tell you so much about this, of what a good uh, this is. Oh, something else I want to tell you is that in the valuations, the same tutors um, realized or said that this process of reflection and these things that try to ref of reflection and of what happens in the education of the professor or the teachers has helped um, to have the com different compre comprehension of what it means, what their work means as well. They have also said that the reality, that the truth is that the human-centered education is almost always in the, in the heart of all teachers, but it, they had not found a way to be able to take it out from their heart and take it over and towards reality. And this is something that is simple and some very logical. So this is what I want to tell you up to there. I don't know if you have any question okay. in relation to the implementation. You said something which um, reminded me of something important, which is, um, <clears throat> as I said, the first principle is not instrumentalize, is to not instrumentalize the the young people, the school, the community, the relationships, but of course the teachers as well. And so actually the the you know what we've called what we call teacher training isn't really teacher training at all, because that's directed only towards the role, the functional role. So actually we try to make a space for the teachers to be together as persons. And that I think was already to some degree, part of this culture of the school before, but that's really central to human-centered education is to try to recognize <laughs> the obvious truth. <laughs> Teachers are also human beings. <laughs> Difficult truth to live up to when we're in an instrumentalized system. Um, Martin, quieres hablar un algo? No, okay, he's not here. I don't I can't, can't see. Yeah, no. Does anybody have any questions or Nisa Kiris does you know? Yeah, go ahead. I have a question about whether uh in your work you involve anything to do with the natural environment surrounding schools and children's and adolescents access to the natural environment uh if you go to the school you'll see the, the, it's really not like that in the slightest it's a really kind of dire urban environment it's a very um <laughs> There's a kind of sad-looking tree in the courtyard, and 
it's uh, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think ideally that would be actually that's one thing about human centered education that we didn't really take sufficiently into consideration. Uh, um, the reason why we wrote a book on well-being was that um, uh, we joined um, um, a group which was part of the European Union, which was called um, Education for Well-being, and. Um, one of the things that we found was I, we couldn't agree, you know, we just felt really uneasy with the, the idea of well-being that they had, which was basically happiness. And so we started to explore the concept of well-being and how well-being should be understood. And I think what you've just mentioned is really important in that respect. It's not just that as well, well-being make, uh, sorry, that natural things make us happy. It's actually that being in the right relationship with the rest of the natural world is actually part of the state of being that we need to be in. And that should be reflected, of course, in all of our institutions, including yes. especially schools. Thank you. I had a question. Go ahead, please. Oh, hello, Akash, how are you? Uh, hello, hello, good to see you again. Yes, so uh, my, my question was that in all these um, years that you've been doing work on human-centered education, in your opinion, which uh, are there alternative schools or systems that come the closest to human-centered education? Oh, I see. Out of the things, out of the places that we visited. Well, I mean, the alternative schools that you've uh, that that you've seen. Yes, I was just curious what your opinion was on, on that. Oh, no, I haven't really thought about that, actually, to be quite honest. I mean, I was quite impressed. Um, I, I, I will say this. This is an important answer. It's not quite the answer to the question you asked. But I, it's really important to acknowledge that um, the GHFP owes a lot to Colegio Amor. Uh, the GHFP team worked for a long time with Colegio Amor. Um, after, I guess, well, for, for, for over the history of the school, but particularly in the later periods, I mean, in recent years, we've worked a lot. And obviously, the approach that we have uh, is quite different from Colegio Amor. Nevertheless, it does actually, um, um, uh, you know, we, we've definitely been influenced by the practices and thinking and approach of Colegio Amor. And so actually, maybe that's the answer to the question is at its best, Colegio Amor really had uh, many elements that we've been talking about. I mean, in particular, I think what was really impressive, and I think in Colegio Amor, which I think we're trying to, you know, instantiate in, um, in, in this school in Tabaida, is the sense of a caring, loving, forgiving, open community that embraces not only the teachers and the young people, but also extends into the local community, the parents and others. I think Colegio Amor at its best was really outstanding in doing that. Thank you, Akash. So, so as we continue on with questions, um, I just want to say really briefly that so we, we have about um, 15 minutes left, 15 to 20 minutes left for our, our 90 minutes. Um, and then I'm sorry, I spoke too long. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it would go in a, I thought I'd be like, last 15 minutes or something. <laughs> of course. Um, and I, I, I know that when we have these larger Zoom meetings, um, it's difficult because everyone has thoughts and questions and ideas, and you know we'd love to hear from every person, but um, you know we can't really do that in this large of a setting. Um, so I just ask that if you if you have a thought or question, um, if you put it in the chat, we're going to keep the chat have record of that, and I'll make sure to send those to Garrett so he can hear all of your ideas, um, and. And and maybe answer questions, you know, if if that's possible in the future as well. So so please. So please. Erica, I'm Erica sorry. Erica has a question. Would it would it be interesting to merge the pillars of human centered education with some of the ICD principles? And um, a, a couple of comments. I mean, one is 
Um, I think as a team, we're quite familiar with the work of ICDP. Um, certainly, um, both in Colombia and also in Norway. So, I mean, I was good friends with um, the ICDP team in Norway. And Anissa, who's here now, I can see her there, um, uh, who is, as well, the leader of ICDP in Colombia, has been working with Rosanna and the team, um, uh, particularly in relationship to the um, recent work with younger kids and parents. So I think that is an area where we will need to grow now that we've um, um, starting to come out the other side of the pandemic desert. So thank you, Erica, for that suggestion. Anissa, ¿tú quieres uh, decir algo acerca de el trabajo de ICDP en relación con la educación basada en el ser humano en el colegio? Sí. Hola. Hola a todos. Hola a todas. Eh, bueno, muy contenta ahora de estar participando. He eh, asimilado todo el proceso eh, que se ha hecho en el colegio. That has happened in the um, school of Pedacito de Cielo, Peace of Sky. I'm working with the parents. I'm very happy because, as Garrett says, there's a point of uh, ICDP and the education, um, human-centered education, the uh, part of the parents we have oriented in working more with the parents because, as you know, ICDP works with the parents in relation to the children, but not, not specifically as uh, the human-centered education and the, um, the children themselves. So it's more like the Pacific, Pacific communication. We um, border their feelings, in the time of pandemic, um, we have given um, tools that are key for communication of um, recognizing and um, of um, emotions. Also, from then, how to treat each other in a good way, and uh, that can help their interactions with the children and inside of their families. And they have had uh, great uh, results, and I'm very happy. And I continue to work on human-centered education. Um, these last few months, I've um, worked with schools with parents and going and touching the feelings of many parents who have still aren't very sensitive with the uh, Pedacito de Cielo's work. Um, as Rosanna says, uh, working a bit in a personalized uh, way, we can tell already this process of sensibilization, our sensibility and the communication and the way of being with the kids uh, from the time, of, from what I can see and all the valuations and the context that uh, the Pedacito de Cielo, Piece of Sky um, brings forward. So it's fundamental also the support of the teachers and of the parents so that the children can be okay, that they can be fine. And we're doing to, um, we're getting to, to places so that parents can feel better and they're got well-being. And so the children also have a good a treatment. And I think this are great, um, Yes, we, we got there. Uh, two things. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nisha. Uh, is that, uh, do you have something else to ask, or is that okay? I saw that Sati asked about Indonesia, and we'd love to introduce this approach to Indonesia. That's really been in our feelings and on our minds. Uh, we're currently, well, over the last few years, we've been looking for ways to actually generate a, an income stream so that we can fund human-centered education work in Indonesia. We've had a couple of approaches, um, but it's not ready yet. We're not, I don't, we're not there yet. Did you want to say something about that, Sharif? Yeah, I, I, I um... I actually feel that that um, Indonesia would be very, very fertile ground for this. Because, um, funnily, I mean, you know, in one manner of speaking, um, the uh, sort of subud idea um, 
that's behind human-centered education. In other words, our understanding and experience that we have from the Latihan. Um, it's, um, in, a, in a sense, it's coming back to Indonesia. Um, it's, a, it's rather an interesting issue because um, I think the human approach, in other words, the, the idea of dealing with people as human beings and being more in your feelings than in your mind and not instrumentalizing people is something that comes naturally to, uh, to people living in this culture. But the interesting thing that I've seen uh, from living a long time in Indonesia is that the educational system is more mental than even in Europe. It's like they took the Dutch system and because it was so strange to them, it became a kind of a, 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 a thing that got imposed on every aspect of education. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I don't want to overstate this, but I, I feel like it would be one, I think the human-centered education would uh, immediately be recognized by teachers here who have, you know, who have been trying to be as Western as possible. And they would, I think, sort of go, oh my God, yes, phew. <laughs> so it will be very interesting for me to see if we can get, if we can actually introduce some of these ideas here to see how it would, how, how, how it would take. I mean, I think that's the problem is in a sense, the, um, in many countries, uh, the academic has divorced itself from the real roots of human intelligence. And so as it were human, <laughs> the academic has bad press. <laughs> and so we can think, oh, it's better to be emotional and relational. And <laughs> But actually, once we start to look into the heart of what it is to be an intelligent thinking person, it's really about being considerate. <laughs> no, I'd like to tell you a story about from Indonesia or a series of stories because yeah. Anyone here who is considered to be educationally advanced is the way they are talked about is how scary they are. Mm -hmm. So, so um, you know, in Indonesia, if a professor is considered really great, they will say, well, you know, when he comes in, everybody's scared. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's like the pinnacle of education. <laughs> I think um, we have uh, um, a question from um, Susanna Rosenthal. Uh, um, a state of flow. Yes, 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 yes. I, I'm. Yeah, I'm very curious because I am attracting a lot of alternative uh, teaching methods and people with expertise to this space that I have. And one group is very interested in the state of flow. I do understand. And, and what I've been struggling with is how to uh, understand this in Subud terms or Latihan terms, or even now, what? how do I uh, evaluate uh, this uh, along with human-centered education? Yeah, I think, um, well, I do have a general comment. So it doesn't really concern human-centered education and more about uh, other work on well-being. Yes. So as you probably understand, and everybody I think understands, the work on human well-being tends to be divided into, I mean, rough, this is really rough, but the orthodox who are more kind of uh, interested in, let's say, well-being and happiness as a kind of economic social indicator. <clears throat> and then uh, as we're, what we might call a positive psychology 
and so um, the the gentleman whose name is almost for me impronounceable, Shishima yes. Haley, uh, wrote a book on creative flow as a way to capture the idea of well-being. And I mean, I do, I, do, I kind of like have two critiques of it actually. Uh, well, one is that um, it's it, it's treated very instrument. Everything else is treated as instrumental. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, basically this moment of flow where all one's psychical, psychic energies are kind of like flowing off and one's totally absorbed in what one's doing, um, that becomes like an end point and everything else in one's life kind of, as it were, serves that. Um, I don't like that. I think that instrumentalization of any state is just a mistake. You know? So it's in that sense, it's too single-minded and then I think secondly you know we have to recognize that uh, as well what makes a human life good and what makes a human life as well worth living is much more multifarious than that it's much more you know and and uh, including and this is what I think one of the sort of problems with positive psychology is that it's you know it's like you have to you have to be positive about everything <laughs> <laughs> and it's yeah. like, and it's not it's not you know i don't think that's really the concept of well-being i think sort of the concept of well-being is that one really uh, it must, has to be much broader and much more inclusive and it has to allow for the possibility that feeling great is not actually um um de definitional of well-being so yeah. so yeah i mean i think probably flow is actually um, a part of creation. It's a part of human creativity, but it's not the whole of human well-being. I, I, I think that sounds like very good uh, guideline there when I'm dealing with these uh, courses and trying to create them because uh, it's, not, it's not that state that you're after. But I think that what I'm sensing in this is there's a great deal of surrender that is actually needed uh, in order to get all of the pieces uh, to uh, not be in control and get to a, a place where you're guided from a di different source. So I keep seeing the need for super teachers <laughs> in, in with this you know, these group of people who are, um, who I'm working with, and I'm introducing it in little pieces, but uh, I, I would love somebody to be on these calls with me so they could say, well, you know, let's look at it this way, you know. So uh, anyway, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I'm totally excited about being in this conversation because these, they start out their, all of their meetings with what's our noble purpose, Yes, you know, yes. so uh, not a bad, not a bad people to be there with, but they need a little bit more uh, uh, experience, you know, or somebody coming in says, "Oh, we've experienced it in this way." So, if anybody is interested in that kind of thing, I would love to talk to them and have them in on the meetings. Thank you. Well, I'm I'm happy to give that a go now that I'm back in the same time zone. Great, great. I wasn't in your times under them. When you sent me some emails, I was in the UK. Great. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch up with all of the um, questions. Could you, oh, we don't have much time, do we? Okay. Is it time for a last question or thing to discuss? Yeah. Okay. From, um... Do you see, Garrett? Um, well, I can't. I, it's too difficult for oh. me to see I, because I'm sort of. There's una pregunta: ¿Cómo hacen para orientar la, la relación intercultural en la formación de estos chicos adolescentes, um, viendo que se muevan con expresiones contemporan, contemporáneas globalizadas? I'm doing my best here. Y ustedes, yes. por, por lo que veo, son orientadores o. Right de otra generación. I understand. So fundamentally, the answer to that is 
you know, we're not trying to assert the, the, the role of the teachers and the psychological school psychologists or social workers. No, what we're trying to do is to as well work with the with the teachers, the school principal, the school psychologists, and as a work kind of like introduce a kind of different feeling or help them <laughs> to recognize their own instincts about a different feeling that the, that's needed, a different approach that's needed. So in other words, um, uh, in, in other words, really, I mean, you know, the, the teachers in the school, they know the kids much better than I do, clearly I do, and or even more than Rosanna does. But, you know, so Rosanna's job, um, the, the human-centered facilitators, as it were, our job is to, to help teachers to grow into a new role and help a school to be a place where there really is a real human relationships that are not institutionalized and are not instrumentalized to goals. Well, I want to say um, thank you so much, Garrett, for offering your time and experience and um, thank you. Um, sharing. Well, thank you to everybody. I thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Thank you to the GHFP to Rosanna and uh, Anissa Martin and the team in Colombia. Um, it's, it's really been a very interesting journey. Yeah, wonderful. If you all would take a moment to unmute your mics and just give a round of applause, like we were all actually here together. <laughs> Yay, thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Sherry. Oh, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Rosanna. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Cool. Ciao. Ciao. Uh, Ciao. Ciao. Muchísimas gracias. <laughs> um, I'd like to end with a uh, with a moment of quiet too. If you need to go, you can if you'd like to stay for the moment of quiet. That would be great. Um, to end our meeting, um, and I'd like to offer a prayer that this experience. Um, can we can we can extract the meaning and importance from this experience and it can be integrated into our life and can be helpful and, and meaningful to us. Um, and Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Good to see you all. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend and a great week. And, and take care. God bless everyone. Gracias. Adrián, the, the traduction in Spanish is possible, the, this, this uh, meeting? Great question. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. When I, when I export it, um, I'll see if there's an option for that. I hope that there is. That would be great. Um, yeah, but I'm not sure I, I, if Miranda's audio is going to be captured. Um, Hamida, do you know about that? No, okay. So Mortal is telling me that it's not. So it's only going to be in English. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you. night. <laughs> Finally made yes. it. <laughs> Bye -bye. Gracias. Bye. 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 Bye
Miranda, gracias. Gracias. Un abrazo para ti. Chao, Danica. Adiós a todos. Bye, bye. 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 bye.